Okay, hi everyone, thanks for coming. So we'll get started. <clears throat> okay, so what's the aim of this seminar? So the title of the seminar is Cell Learning Theory. Uh, there are a few reasons for this. Uh, this seminar series, the proximate cause of it is that my friend and collaborator, uh, Michael, uh, works on this kind of thing and is interested in connecting some of the ideas on computation and geometry and so on uh, that I've worked on and many of my uh, brilliant students have worked on over the last few years to open questions in how to understand computation and learning in biology. Uh, this is a very pressing issue in biology as biology moves from a kind of descriptive science to an engineering uh, discipline where we attempt to harness the um, sort of nanomachines that are all around us to do um, more than they currently do and things that we desire them to do. Okay, so let me start, however, I mean, there are many applications potentially of a deeper understanding of computation in biology, but let me start from a fundamental question. So this is a question uh, that, as some of you know, I, I spent quite a bit of time thinking about. Uh, what is the fundamental nature of computation as a mathematical structure? That's a bit different to uh, what is computable. And so this question, to some extent, you could consider answered, putting aside quantum computers uh, by Turing and Gödel and Church and uh, Post and um, others, uh, you know, midway or so through the 20th century. But then the sort of nature of computation itself, the process of computing or, or what, uh, what that we observe about the processes in the world that compute is fundamental and what is accidental. Uh, this question is far from being answered. And if one is interested in that, then I think one can't really avoid being interested in the systems around us that compute. And it seems relevant if you're interested in computation to observe uh, that nature has been computing for something like a billion years, right? At least on Earth, probably longer, but that's a conservative estimate. Well, maybe you disagree because you don't think that nature is computing anything. Uh, I'll address that throughout this talk, getting into why I think it's reasonable to call it computation and why it's reasonable to suspect that learning happens at a much more uh, small scale than otherwise you would assume is sort of the purpose of this first seminar. All right, so what kind of computation is taking place in nature, let's say in cells? Uh, and what does understanding this natural computation tell us about computation as an abstract mathematical phenomenon? Well, there are many systems in nature that compute. I mean, your brain, presumably, you would agree, computes to some degree. Uh, that's a familiar example of computation, and for that reason, I don't want to spend too much time on it, although we can discuss it. What I want to introduce is an example that maybe is a little less familiar, and that example is gene regulatory networks. As I'll explain, gene regulatory networks, or GRNs, uh, kind of the engine of computation within cells. Okay. So let me move to the next board. So I'm going to choose among several potential candidates programs as the kind of central mathematical structure to focus on in comparing uh, the kinds of computation that we see in cells and the kind of computation that we see in our computers. 
So without doubt, the central mathematical object in theoretical computer science is the program. So as I said, one way of distinguishing, there are of course many similarities between the kind of computation we find in living systems and the kind of computation that uh, our computers do, but that's kind of pretty familiar. I think it's by now a kind of truism that people think of a link between, or an analogy between computers and living systems that's widely spread in the culture. It's not important for me therefore to reiterate it, but we can focus uh, more on the differences. So one way of distinguishing, I'll call them natural programs, by which I mean the the things that get executed, say, in cells from normal programs. It's, of course, a bit of a strange terminology given that nature's been computing a hell of a lot longer than we have, but uh, anyway, they're normal, perhaps, to us. Uh, I should say three ways. Feel free to ask questions at any point, as usual. Uh, three ways of distinguishing natural programs from normal programs are, and I'm going to address each of these points in turn. The first is that uh, natural programs, and again, gene regulatory networks will be my example, main example today. They naturally form spaces. So discrete programs, like a program in Python say, uh, maybe they have numbers in them that are in principle real numbers, but uh, that's not actually a source of continuity because that real number is not actually a real number, right? It's just some sequence of zeros and ones somewhere. Uh, so in some fundamental sense, the programs we write could be considered to be discrete. They don't fall into spaces that have a um, continuous character. However, gene regulatory networks are, are not like that. They're fundamentally continuous. And I'll give very concrete examples of each of these. Another distinction is that as opposed to normal programs, uh, natural programs are learned almost uh, without exception, not constructed. That is, they're always embedded in a process which produces them, which is not a process of reason or logic, uh, but more like optimization. And finally, and this is you know, not a surprise, I guess, uh, to those of you who have been following my obsessions in recent years, natural programs uh, exhibit singularities. And, and the, the upshot of this is that you should really not buy into the idea that nature is running Turing machines. This is just wrong as a conceptual framework. Uh, I mean, it's, it's useful to some extent, right? It's useful to know that computation is taking place in nature. And, you know, if you think about computation as being about things like Turing machines, that's not wrong. Uh, but it's pretty misleading. So as I pointed out on the previous board, uh, Turing machines and other models of computation are the end of the story when it comes to what is computable, but it doesn't exhaust the possible modes of computation. Uh, and biology is a clear example of that, where the natural form of computation that exists in, nat in uh, biology is, is not well modeled by Turing machines, I would argue. Um, at least some aspects of it. We'll hear later in the seminar series uh, from a speaker who's done some very interesting work on, on the possibility for universal computation using RNA, which would you know tend to, I guess, push directly against the statement I'm just making, but that'll be interesting to argue about. Okay, um, if there's no questions, I'll just move straight on to one. Uh, actually, no, I'm planning to give some background on GRNs first. I'm not sure how much of this I'll get through in this first lecture. So maybe this is actually a plan for two seminars. Okay, so here's a diagram of uh, 
a bit of basic biology, which I'll now recall for you. So at the bottom you see in blue DNA. Uh, DNA, which is uh, discrete, is the source, if you like, of truth for what computation takes place in cells. I'm very much an amateur when it comes to biology, so I'll communicate my understanding, but uh, Michael would point out that every single aspect of this story has 10 extra layers of complexity behind it, about which I'm probably completely ignorant. So this is very much just the simple surface layer of the structure here. So this green outer line is meant to indicate a cell, cell wall. Uh, this story with DNA, mRNA, protein, uh, transcription factors uh, also, I mean, happens in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes, so both in our cells and bacterial cells. Uh, and I'll basically not, um, there are some differences when it comes to mRNA and how it works, but I, I'll stay away from that. So the basic story is that genes exist in DNA. Those are transcribed into mRNA, messenger RNA. So you can see RNA polymerase there, that pink blob uh, that reads the genome, passes along it linearly, translates it into messenger RNA that then passes out into the cell, is grabbed by ribosomes, which then synthesize proteins. So the mRNA codes for proteins via codons, so triples of um, nucleotides, A, C, G, T, um, or an mRNA, uh, T is replaced by a U. Proteins, some of them uh, form catalysts that catalyze important reactions in cells. They form structural, uh, they perform structural uh, tasks within the cell. And some of them are transcription factors, TF. So a transcription factor is a protein uh, or another molecule which acts to regulate how genes are transcribed into mRNA. So you can see these arrows going back from the ribosome to the genome. And the way they act is, for example, by preventing RNA polymerase from binding to a particular gene and transcribing it, or recruiting polymerase to upregulate a gene. So as you're probably aware, the difference between the different cell tissues in your body is not one of uh, code in the sense of DNA. It's a difference of regulation or expression. And that level of expression is controlled by transcription factors. So that's the first example of transcription factors. So a gene uh, can regulate, in this case, it goes back to regulate itself, which is possible, but uh, genes often produce proteins which go and regulate something else. That's the standard means of regulation. So genes regulate each other's production, but also there are signals from outside a cell which regulate genes. So I'll give an example in a moment. That'll be my first concrete example of a gene regulatory network is a bacteria responding to uh, lactose. So there can be signals in the environment which are turned into proteins by devices on the cell wall. Those proteins act as transcription factors. I mean generally through some computational process, not directly. So they, they interact with other proteins, and then the output of that interaction is a transcription factor, which regulates the production of some gene. So in that way, signals from the environment change the code that's being executed inside a cell. So when I say that cells compute, uh, and this isn't uh, my terminology, this is a standard way of talking about it, uh, what I'm referring to uh, the dot, dot, dots here. Uh, so this computation taking place in networks of proteins, this computation taking place uh, in networks of proteins here, and the genes themselves uh, will be activated if certain transcription factors are present and not activated if they're not. And those transcription factors have logical interactions. You can have and and or and not. And it's those... Uh, interactions between different genes which form the computational basis of what's happening in terms of gene regulation inside a cell. Maybe I'll pause there if, in case there's questions about this picture. I do have a question. So yep. um, are we thinking of the DNA part of 
things as like an OS layer? Because you, you mentioned that uh, the program is more on the epigenetics and the transcription factors um, layer. And yeah, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to distinguish those. So the DNA, of course, is discrete. So that, I guess, is why people, well, it was also the first to be discovered. So people thought of for a long time, I guess, DNA and the code that's executed in a cell as being pretty discrete. Uh, but uh, I would say that the DNA, well, here I'm actually speculating myself, I guess. I don't think this is a, maybe this isn't a standard way of talking about it, but you could read the the genome as being a sort of index into a continuous space of programs, which are the gene regulatory networks, which actually do the computation. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll draw this diagram already. Uh, this was something I was going to talk about in a moment, but um, if I just draw in, or maybe I can, maybe I can put it here. Sorry. Um, So the picture I'm going to try and articulate, and uh, again, I'm not an authority on this. I think I'll stop saying that because it's obsequious. But um, So there's a discrete set of possible genomes, uh, but the possible expressions uh, are continuous. So um, I don't know how to talk about this but in general, but let's just say gene regulatory networks. So those form a continuous space of possible concentrations of various regulatory molecules and so on. Um, and you can think of those as mapping into there somewhere, possible determining, I mean, one way of thinking about it is it determines initial conditions for the dynamical system, which is the gene regulatory network. But there's a kind of distinction between the discrete nature of this and the continuous nature of that. And there definitely is continuous variation, even within single tissues, in uh, the gene regulatory networks that are actually executing and responsible for the phenotype, phenotype. Does that answer your question? Or? Um, I think my question is uh, more on what do we consider the program code and what do we consider the, the input? We could easily say that the, um, that the state of the various concentration of the regulatory network as the input to the discrete program, which is the genome, uh, uh, that, or, or we can say that those things, uh, those concentrations are, are the program and it's the environment, which is the input. Um, mm. it, it's kind of where we want to draw the line or, or maybe there's some more, uh, more clear demarcation. Um, yeah, uh, it's so, just unclear that um, that this this is the the, the the true way of thinking it for me. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I don't I don't think I have a I don't think I have a an answer to that question. I guess the way I, I tend to think about it is uh, to think about the state of the various concentrations of proteins and so on that that make up the gene regulatory network as being a bit like the state of a universal Turing machine or a probabilistic universal Turing machine where part of the tape of a universal Turing machine is the code that is being executed and part of the content of the tape of a universal Turing machine is the working tape that that code is being executed on. Um, so I would tend to think, I mean, certainly there's information in the state of the GRN which is not deterministically a function of the genome, right? Because uh, well, the genome is the same across all tissues in your body, but de the development process means that the, the gene regulatory network inside a given cell in a given tissue reaches some equilibrium, which is different from the other cells in your body. So there's information in the state of the GRN, which uh, is true state separate from the genome. But at the same time, the sort of overall program that's being executed is, you know, pretty hard to argue that's not a deterministic function of the genome. So I, I tend to think of the genome as coding for something like a universal Turing machine, part of which is code and in some sense, and part of which is state. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe we'll come back to this when we have a bit more vocabulary. Um, yep. Yeah, but I, I don't pretend, I think it's an interesting question. I don't pretend to have, a, have an answer. Um, um, Dan, can I ask a, a question real quickly? And please yeah. give a 
super brief answer because I'm sure this is a dumb question um, because I'm even more I'm, I'm fantastically ignorant about not only biology but also about computation so I apologize <laughs> in advance um, but th there must be not there but it, it seems it seems seems to me that 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 layers of um, uh, there must be layers of nested computation, right? So one machine, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's all in terms of Turing machines, all the way, if it's turtles all the way down kind of thing. But I'm looking at the genomes and the GRNs diagram you added um, uh, and, and, and the idea that there's a continuous space there. But at some level of analysis, like down at the molecular or atomic or subatomic level, aren't those, isn't that space ultimately discrete at, 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 some, at some different level of analysis and can't, don't programs like you know we can run turing machines um you know yeah. um <clears throat> uh, at the level of a human being talking about them or thinking about them and then you know there's there's multiple levels all the way down and i'm wondering how that uh uh, uh is there a clear way for or, or a simple way for distinguishing the different levels of analysis there or do they do they kind of flow into one another? Is there a clear way to understand that that is sort of a, a explain it like I'm five answerable question, or is that this really yeah. impossible thing yeah. to get into? No, that's a good question. I think that's right. That okay, so if we step back and talk about ordinary computers for a moment, even though fundamentally everything is discrete, um, of course the physical system in which it's instantiated is is continuous, but that doesn't seem to matter very much. So all the code is discrete but still if you're running code at the level of a data center well there are you know it's it's useful to pay attention to signals that are averages over a lot of computation happening across many thousands of machines and then that's a bit like thermodynamics right that's effectively a continuous quantity it's a bit like the number of you know the number of uh, copies of a given um, element or molecule in a chemical reaction it's a discrete number but it's so ridiculously large that you know you can talk about the derivative of the concentration with respect to time or something and it's not crazy to do that um, so there's it's kind of a choice the level of analysis that is useful uh, whether that is discrete or continuous and i suppose yeah i, I, th I think maybe the more articulate way to say it is that fundamentally the most useful way of thinking about programs in theoretical computer science as they run on our machines is discrete Turing machines say well we do consider probabilistic Turing machines which are you know in some sense not discrete uh, and on the other end whatever the true maybe I don't really believe in you know the the true underlying nature whether that's discrete or continuous uh, but the most useful way of thinking about programs in biology, I think, is continuous rather than discrete. And yeah, I think you can you can keep alternating which one you think is appropriate as you zoom in further and further. But uh, at at a top level, I think it's useful to to contrast the continuous nature of biological computation with the discrete nature of computation in machines um, as a first pass understanding of the nature of computation that happens. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. That's great. It actually makes me wonder if the the right way to think about units of analysis or levels of analysis is are can they are they are you at a level where programs are intelligible? And if you're not, then you're not at the right level of analysis. Then you're not at a le meaningful level of analysis. Anyway, thanks, mm. Dan. That's an interesting answer. Yeah, to make a concrete uh, state a concrete fact. In that direction so uh, you might think that cells are bags of molecules and that there's a sort of continuum limit where it's all thermodynamical and and so on and that's sometimes appropriate but the some of these regulatory proteins can have an impact on cell behavior when there's like one or two copies around or very small numbers um, so gene transcription and gene regulation is fundamentally stochastic uh, meaning that it isn't always the case that you can rely on the law of large numbers and just call everything a probability. Sometimes individual events can shape the development of a cell uh, in the sense that like a, 
particular transcription factor molecule happening to bind at a particular time just through chance can make a difference, not just the absolute number of that molecule that's sort of around. Um, so that's worth keeping in mind. So that's, well, like many of these things, it's sort of every point of view is, is sort of true all at once, which is why biology is maybe hard. Okay, um, but I'll, I'll define gene regulatory networks now because so we've spent enough time uh, building up to that, I think. <clears throat> okay. So a gene regulatory network Yeah, well, as per the earlier question, it's actually the sort of a duality here where you can either view the genes as fundamental or the proteins as fundamental. Uh, is the genome just a place that the, the programs executed by the GRNs store their information, a bit like the operating system writing to disk? Like on your computer, is the living process of the operating system and its state the computer or is it what's stored in the hard drive and, or you know you could you could view the operating system as instantiated from the hard drive uh, so in this case um, i'm not sure of the answer but the way often people define it is to prioritize the genes so a gene regulatory network is a collection of genes that interact with each other in the manner i just explained by regulation. That is, gene one produces a transcription factor um, which regulates gene two. And this controls cell function, including development, differentiation, and responding to environmental cues. I won't write that down. I kind of talked about that already. And a few bullet points. I mean, <laughs> that's it for the definition. Uh, such as it is. A few bullet points though. So uh, generally speaking, there's on the order of thousands of genes interacting in this way in any given cell, say in our cells. Uh, and there's an important temporal aspect. So they interact to manifest specific spatial and temporal patterns. Spatial patterns, even within a cell, so the concentration of given gene products in particular places in the cell is controlled by these networks, uh, but also temporal patterns. So you could have a particular network which just implements a clock or happens to trigger something every three minutes, uh, for example. I already mentioned this, so maybe I'll just write something brief. Um, so regulatory modules, I think that was called a cis regulatory region in the diagram. Uh, so the, the part possibly near a gene, which is where the transcription factors controlling the transcription of that gene are located. So there are particular regions on uh, the DNA to which transcription factors or repressors uh, bind. And I just want to reiterate the point that uh, multiple transcription factors can affect a gene. So that is multiple inputs, right? Transcription factor one and transcription factor two may both be necessary in order for a gene to be transcribed at high rates. Of course, it's stochastic. So, you know, the, the transcription factor, think of it as a molecule that's attaching and detaching from the DNA with some probability and it's wandering around in this uh, thermal way. And if there's a lot of it around, then much of the time there will be a transcription factor bound to that petition, that particular place on the genome, and therefore that gene will be transcribed. Um, with high probability. And as the concentration of the transcription factor approaches some very high value, it's almost certain that it's being transcribed, that gene. Um, okay, multiple inputs. Uh, and a given transcription factor may regulate multiple genes. 
Okay, so you should have in your head something like a graph, right? So you could uh, think of a graph where the vertices are genes and the edges are, maybe I'll draw it, so gene G, gene G prime, gene G double prime, and you could draw an edge if gene G produces, I mean, under transcription and translation leads to a protein called the gene product. So if the, if the product of the gene G uh, is a uh, transcription factor that regulates the gene G prime, then we draw an arrow like this. Okay, so this is an example of gene G prime with multiple inputs. And you could associate numbers to these to indicate the levels of concentration. of product products of gene g uh, so again i'm not assuming you're super familiar with um with how this science works but just to briefly mention that this vector a a prime a double prime is to some degree measurable uh, i should put an asterisk there so what people do is you can crack open a cell and, well, remember that the gene goes through two stages. It first becomes mRNA and then it becomes a protein. Um, well, it becomes, yeah, there's some difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. But, uh, so this is somehow the thing that we consider to be the gene product, but that's maybe harder to measure. But this you can measure because it, it comes with a complementary base pair that you can stick on a stationary thing that's on a chip, and then you can measure how often something gets bound to that complementary thing, and in that way count the number of occurrences of a given mRNA in a test tube. So if you mash up a bunch of, bunch of cells and then do that counting, you'll get something like this vector here, modulo many details and, and, uh, and so on that I don't understand, but that's the idea. So you can measure this gene expression level by doing that counting and then some normalization. Um, and that's a proxy for the concentration of the proteins, which if you like is sort of the state of the gene regulatory network. And that can be done on single cells nowadays. So um, that's a large part of computational biology is analyzing the results of such experiments. So for our purposes, we'll just take it as read that you can access the state of those concentrations. Okay, so I want to give an example. Uh, any questions? So example. And the example is the, the program, uh, if lactose then enzyme. So E. coli has three genes. So this is a standard example you'll find in textbooks. Uh, has three genes that code for enzymes which metabolize lactose. So under normal conditions, uh, those genes are repressed. Now what that means is that there's some uh, repressor protein that's present in a particular region of the DNA. So let's say this is gene one, this is gene two, this is gene three inside E. coli. Uh, there's some region these regions have names. I don't actually understand how to precisely distinguish them, but uh, so this is a repressor protein that under normal condition is, is bound to a, to a part of the regulatory region which prevents uh, RNA polymerase from transcribing those genes. But that, op that repressor is such that lactose can bind to it. So if lactose is present, it will bind to the repressor and remove it and therefore allow the transcription of those genes. 
All right, so then those genes will be transcribed. You get the enzymes, which allow you to process the lactose. And I guess eventually, when the lactose is all metabolized, uh, that repressor can find its way back to um, that location. Okay, so this is to go back to the very beginning of the seminar and, and just to comment on, if you don't think that's computation, then uh, you know I don't know what will please you, right? Uh, that's pretty clear response to an input, the presence of lactose determining a behavior um, at the level of the cell. So and there's many you know, innumerable examples of, uh, of that kind of thing in bacteria and also in our cells. Our cells are more complicated because they tend not to react directly to external stimuli like this. They rather have more complicated interactions. Um, but bacteria often respond to signals from the environment or the presence of molecules in the environment by, by directly um, sort of short chains of computation leading to up or down regulation of genes. Okay. Um, so I already sketched out how you might think about a gene regulatory network as a graphical network in the sense of um, Bayesian statistics, where you have some probability of observing. I mean, if you think about the concentration of a gene product as being uh, a, so divide the concentration by the total, the maximum concentration, and think about that as a probability affecting the probability of other genes to be either on or off, uh, on being highly concentrated and off being not very concentrated. The, the language of genes on or off is, is too simplistic, uh, but um, you know, I guess that's uh, one way that's used to commonly talk about it. Okay, so the point of introducing that way of thinking about the gene regulatory network in terms of those concentrations is to make the point that the map from genotype to phenotype So the map from DNA to observed behavior uh, goes via this continuously parameterized set of gene regulatory networks. Which you could, if you like, think of as parameterized by those three numbers. Okay, so it's... Uh, Maybe we should say a little bit about each one of these arrows. So this arrow here, uh, well, that's basically what I just described, right? The state of that gene regulatory network determines what happens when lactose appears. I mean, uh, maybe it's not as simple as it just binding directly to the repressor in examples that are more complicated than this. So the actual behavior of the cell is determined by directly by the gene regulatory network. And how does this map work? Uh, well, that's got to do with development and differentiation. And I'm not really qualified to say much about that. Um, I think the point to make is that it's not like the cells in your body. I mean, they, they arise by copying, right? And that copying is not a blank slate. It acquires some of the state from the cell that was the parent which is why you know, the cell in your skin divides. It's not some other random type of cell, I guess. Uh, how much of the state of the parent cell in terms of the state of its regulatory network is passed on to the child cell, I don't know. Uh, so I don't pretend to understand exactly how this map works because this map has to do with the fact that a given cell uh, has a parent and that parent has a parent and that chain is what we mean by development and differentiation. Um, but it's clear that uh, there is some kind of factorization like this between the discrete code of the genome and the actual behavior of a given cell. Okay, maybe I'll pause there. Um, are there any... Yeah, I should say that there are notes for this talk on the web page which contain references to papers that spell out the details, for example, of this comment about differentiation and 
the claim I made earlier that there's continuous variation of gene regulatory networks within tissues. Uh, this argument that GRNs form a continuously parameterized space would, would of course be disingenuous if uh, in practice only a finite number of GRNs really appear, right? And they make discrete transitions between some discrete numbers of these vectors. I mean, if, if I called that, uh, I don't know, V1, if there was V1 through Vn, and those were the only possible concentrations in gene regulatory networks, and the computation just involved transitions between those, maybe with some intermediate states, but fundamentally you could understand it as a finite state machine just transitioning between those vectors. Then the argument that this is a continuously parameterized space would kind of be fake. Uh, but that's not the case. You actually do find continuous variation in these measurements of RNA concentrations, mRNA concentrations in cells, often from like one end of a tissue to another. And there's a great paper in the references that goes through that. So I think I'm correct in saying that you should understand gene regulatory networks as fundamentally continuously parameterized. Any questions? All right, so that brings me back to, maybe I'll just walk back over there. Um, brings me back to the picture I drew here, uh, right here of the map from the genome. the map from the genome to the uh, GRNs. Right. So the genome's discrete and it picks out certain points in the space of um, GRNs, which I'm going to refer to as examples of uh, natural programs. So that was my first point, right? That natural programs, GRNs, form a space. Uh, the second point is about learning and the fundamental role that learning has to play in computation in living systems. Learning is not apparently, at least not until recently, as fundamental in our programs. Right? To date, most of the programs that we've run have been constructed by people, by reason, rather than learned. And that's changing, but we tend to think of that as a newfangled thing rather than something fundamental to the structure of computation itself. I think the example of computation in biology uh, should sort of bring that into question a bit. Okay, but let me explain uh, part of the role of learning in gene regulatory networks. And this is, this is more controversial, I guess. Okay, so I'm going back to the first board. So two, our natural programs are learned. So the first thing to say that is that uh, in nature, computation and learning are both ubiquitous and closely related. It's actually difficult to disentangle the two in living systems. So to go in one direction, uh, learning even the definitions, which I'll review in a moment, about which there isn't a lot of agreement, but uh, most definitions of learning that would take place in living systems tend to involve some kind of idea of information processing or computation, right? So uh, maybe I'll just give one of the definitions. Again, the references are in the notes. Uh, so this is a standard survey paper on learning in biology that's often cited uh, for this topic. And they give us an, a sort of an umbrella definition. There's many definitions of learning across neuroscience, cognitive science, uh, biology, um, subfields of all of those, and they vary slightly, as, as you may know. But 
this paper is attempting to synthesize out of all of those a kind of common core. And what they come up with is that learning is structured updating. I don't actually like this definition, but uh, this is a standard thing to say of structured updating of system properties based on processing of new information. So you see the role of processing here, and I can maybe, uh, why is processing required? Well, because there's fundamentally a many to one problem involved here that you have to invert, right? So if you get information from the outside world, for example, that something you did is wrong, well, it isn't obvious what change to make in your computation to correct for that error. And maybe there's more than one change you could make. So uh, just observing the outside world is not enough to determine instantly the change you should make. I mean, the example of, you could call the reaction to lactose. Um, yeah, so, okay, here's a question. Is the example I gave just now of E. coli responding to lactose learning? Uh, doesn't seem like it should be, right? It's just reacting. But I think it actually fits this definition, right? Structured updating of the system. Well, a repressor protein is no longer there that was there. That's about as structural as it gets. Uh, based on processing of new information. Well, there was lactose came in. The cell processed it by having the repressor designed to bind to lactose. That's That interaction is certainly qualifies as a simple form of processing. So... I think actually that counts as learning by this definition. So that makes this definition not very good, I think. Um, I, was, uh, I have a question, comment or question. Yeah. Wouldn't that make, um, say, uh, a gas expanding when a, in, a, <laughs> in a wall, um, uh, in a box, when a wall is removed, uh, learning as well? Yeah, right. I think that's a good example. Um, yeah, I don't know if the structured part would be used to argue against that. Uh, well, it's uh, pretty predictable to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, think, I think I kind of agree with that critique, so I, I can't really play devil's advocate. But I think, it's, I think these definitions have the flavor to me of I kind of know it when I see it uh, in the sense that the, the person invoking the definition will reject certain things that fit it and accept others because of some other sort of ulterior internal definition of learning that they're using that they can't articulate. Uh, so, which is part of why I think this definition, I mean, maybe it's hard to have a definition, but I think this is clearly deficient. Uh, I'll repeat a definition which I gave uh, back in the SLT seminar, um, which I, I gave an example there of how I don't think that just, inf just responding to information should count as learning. Uh, and I think that critique holds to that this definition as well. A second one, again, see the notes for references, says that uh, learning refers, and this is better, I think, to any persistent and adaptive, and this is the word that really makes this definition better, modification, I mean, it's got its own problems now, but. Uh, of an organism's behavior. Uh, this matters as well, right? Um, that behavior is somehow the focus as a function of its experience. That's the same computation idea. This is a bit more similar to the definition, still not the same as what I gave in the first seminar of the SLT series. Uh, maybe we can argue about these later. That'll be fun. Um, but given the time, maybe I, I want to build on this and make a couple of points before we, before we end. Yep. So whatever you think about those definitions, they certainly involve computation, right? So it's hard to make sense of learning without some kind of computation and vice versa. Uh, the forms of computation that we observe in nature are the product of gradual variation and optimization, not reason. And let me just name uh, some of the forms 
of some of the forms of learning that we observe in nature that lead to uh, deliberate processing of information in action, which is uh, computation. Of course, the obvious example is evolution. After that, perhaps the most um, common example of learning that we would think about is the learning that we do in our brains or nervous systems. Uh, perhaps you're less familiar with forms of learning that happen outside of brains, but uh, while well, the immune system is a, a an example of learning of current interest, um, clearly when you show uh, your immune system an example of a virus or part of a virus to which it's supposed to react, that's a form of learning by either of these definitions, right? And that's not learning that's happening in your brain. So that those three aren't controversial. More controversial is that learning can happen in individual cells, whether those are bacterial cells or um, cells in your body. Uh, maybe we don't have time to go into why that's controversial. There were important experiments that seemed to show this in certain model organisms. Those experiments were questioned, and then the whole topic was kind of left uh, without a lot of attention for a long time. It's been revisited in recent years. Uh, the citations are in the notes again. Uh, as an outsider, it seems to me kind of weird to question this to the degree it's questioned. It seems a bit dogmatic. Um, what would it take for you to be convinced that learning takes place in cells? Well, you'd have to have, I mean, some kind of persistent change in a gene regulatory network as a result of experience, which say led a bacteria to approach or not approach a given uh, candidate location for food, depending on whether it found food there in the past or not. And that's exactly the kind of experiment that was done and, and has been reproduced. Um, but there remain questions about exactly whether that is learning or not, or just some other form of conditioning that you wouldn't call learning. So it kind of shades into an argument about the definition that I don't find very interesting. So my impression from reading the literature and experiments is that, yeah, by, by my definition, learning takes place in cells. I'm not super interested in debating it. So I think for the purposes of this seminar series, I'll just take it for granted that we agree on that. Uh, and maybe by sticking to concrete examples that I think uh, are learning, we can just do an end run around disagreeing about that. But I, I do want to flag that it is considered controversial by some. Um, okay, uh, how should I wrap this up? Well, a good question, and this seminar series will just be full of questions because there aren't a lot of answers. Um, a good question is what kind of learning? Right? I mean, it's probably not function regression. It's not like cells are sitting there learning to map particular inputs to particular outputs, although maybe in some cases they are. Is it reinforcement learning? Uh, cells or other forms of learning in biology, optimizing a kind of reward signal over a space of actions. And what is the correct mathematical formulation of the kind of learning that takes place in individual cells? The reason to focus on individual cells is I think that gene regulatory networks are a well-studied, excellent example of continuously parameterized computation in nature. Uh, but uh, of course, and the kind of learning that takes place in brains is better studied, right? There's plenty of mathematical analysis of, of that kind of learning. Uh, and it's, um, well, also interesting, uh, but maybe not what I want to focus on in this seminar series. So what kind of learning is it? Uh, the fact that there are um, 
in many places, degeneracies in the mapping from genome to phenotype. So this is the third part of this seminar, which I guess we'll have to do last time. But there are degeneracies, I'll outline them. Uh, codon degeneracy is one, that's what the floor you're standing on shows the translation of codons to amino acids, by the way. And if you look at the center of the circle, you'll see some examples where uh, multiple distinct sequences of three letters get translated to the same um, amino acid. So that's an example of a degeneracy in that translation from genome to phenotype. But multiplicative interactions in gene transcription are perhaps the more uh, interesting one because they're continuous degeneracies as opposed to discrete ones. Uh, so a codon degeneracy is, is a discrete degeneracy. It's a many to one map, but codons are a discrete set. But the interactions between transcription factors, if there are multiple transcription factors on a gene, you can think of that as the appearance of a product of two probabilities or concentrations in the corresponding differential equations or graphical um, networks. And that is a common, then. so for those of us who think about, say, singular learning theory, such multiplicative terms are sort of the bread and butter of how degeneracies arise in learning processes. So those are all over the place in biology, those degeneracies. It's, uh, you look at the literature for 10 seconds and you'll, you'll, uh, you'll notice uh, how, how degenerate this mapping is at both of those stages from genome to GRN and from GRN to phenotype. So the question uh, I'm interested in thinking about in the seminar series is, well, what is the biological significance of those degeneracies? If learning is indeed fundamental in how the form of computation in cells, um, if learning is indeed fundamental to the form of computation in cells, uh, then those degeneracies seem like they might matter. So that's another topic I want to pursue. But maybe to conclude, I'll just uh, read a little passage um, from uh, Gershman et al., which is the paper I took the second definition of learning from. Single cells continue to surprise us. Robert Hooke, peering through his microscope in the 17th century, first likened cells to the small rooms, cellular, inhabited by monks. Fast forward to the 21st century, and it is now banal for cell biologists to think of the cell as a miniature computer, capable of sophisticated information processing. Among their many capabilities, it is now appreciated that cells have memory, possibly in the form of a histone code though a precise computational understanding of this code has remained elusive. Whatever the memory code may be, its implications for neuroscience are far-reaching. We may finally be poised to link cellular, me cellular memory codes with cognitive information processing. In this context, the studies by Gelber and others of learning in paramecia become freighted with significance. So those experiments, the ones I referred to as controversial evidence of learning in single cells. Um, all right, so I think that's a reasonable sketch of some of the threads that I want to pursue in this seminar. Um, thanks for listening, and now uh, ask me questions, please. Um, I do have some questions. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's more like a devil's advocate comment <laughs> than anything. Um, please, yeah. The so uh, there's there's two kind of objections actually. So uh, it could be argued that for just so it could be argued that the the computers that we are familiar with, the discrete zeros and ones, are actually um, average versions of continuous quantities. Like um, they are uh, they are they are millions of atoms um, averaged together to give the like uh, the voltage of ones and zeros, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just and conversely, it could be argued that the continuous um, nature of um, the GRNs may be only discrete states, discretized states are important, for example. Mm -hmm. um, like the, the absolute number, uh, real number of the concentration of the matter, it's um, the level, certain discretized levels that matters more uh, perhaps so um, that's that's one objection 
um, the other objection is the, the, the very first claim about um, uh, the nature has been computing for uh, about a billion years, which uh, why not 13 point uh, whatever billion uh, years? <laughs> um, like, does it include physics? So I, I, I guess this is um, the, the kind of objection people make when, um, when yeah. NATO yeah. always have a good definition. Um, yeah, I think those are both good questions. Uh, maybe I'll deal with the second one first. Yeah, it often irritates me when people define the term computation too broadly and just say everything is computation or something along those lines that just removes the term as being useful. Uh, so, you know, maybe there's a sense in which physics computes on its own, but uh, it's very, I think it's, uh, I mean, that's a question mark, right? And maybe a philosophical question. Um, I don't find it particularly interesting, really. But if anything is computing, cells are, right? I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, what would you allow as a computation, a program running on our computer? Well, I think if that same physical process just happened to occur in nature accidentally and had no intent behind it at all, maybe it wouldn't count as computation, right? I mean, computation has to involve some kind of distinctions that make sense and provide information to the person receiving the output, right? It, it can't just be that. I think you could, you could definitely make the argument that the same physical process is or is not computation depending on the context, the signals going in and out exist, in, right? Um, so, that's that's clear right because you could arrange rocks on a hill in such a way that rolling a marble down the hill computes the digits of pi if you were prodigious enough um, but uh, somebody walking past who has no, no idea of what the significance of that arrangement is um, I mean, if you disappeared off the face of the earth and the way you were encoding that computation into the rocks disappeared with you it's maybe a little hard to say that that is any longer not just an arrangement of rocks, right? Uh, but that's a, maybe a tricky point. But I think well, the computation taking place in cells, I mean, I, I think that's as unambiguously computational as any program we write. Maybe there's a, maybe that's a difficult in, in any case to make precise, but I think it's, if you would admit one, I can't see how you can fail to admit the other. Uh, but I think on that grounds, one doesn't have to admit all of nature and all of the history of the universe as being computational. I think that's, uh, so I don't think it, it degenerates in that way. Um, regarding the first comment, yeah, I think that's right. That's the most, I think that's the best response to what I'm trying to say here. Uh, but history, I think, proves that wrong. So people at first thought exactly that. If you look back in the literature, even as recently as like 2005, uh, people wrote about gene regulation as though it's on and off and it's logic. I mean, people thought the model, so to begin with, people thought the model of how genes work was very much logical. It's binary, it's on or off, and it's a logic network. And it's just a question of understanding which network and understanding what it does. Uh, but understanding has shifted a lot in the last two decades away from that view. Uh, so, and I think, yeah, I'd take a look at that article. It's AD in the references, which talks about the variation in the um, gene regulatory networks in tissues. I think that's a, a conclusive answer to that objection. I think uh, it is not binary on and off that uh, it is continuous. I think that's kind of an unambiguous conclusion from from recent years of, there's been a lot of research on, on this area in, in recent years. Um, and I think that's where the field has ended up. That's my understanding anyway. Um, yep, got it. But yeah, those are, uh, yeah, if indeed GRNs were in some sense fundamentally discrete, um, then I'm not sure it's, well, there's the problem of understanding what they do, but I don't think it's computationally very interesting, or at least I don't see. From the point of view of a fundamental 
it's like a mathematical point of view. Uh, I don't have, I wouldn't have a lot of interest in the problem if it were in, in that sense, discrete. Uh, 